Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's presentation, Manage Decades of Technical Debt More Efficiently, brought to you by ThreatStat. I'd like to introduce you to our presenters. Patrick Cable is a Senior Infrastructure Security Engineer at, Thre at ThreatStat. As an infrastructure security engineer, Patrick focuses on ensuring the security of the ThreatStack platform by collaborating with other departments, implementing and building security tools, and developing new technology to make security easier for everyone in the organization. Uh, James Wickett spends a lot of time at the intersection of the DevOps and security communities. He works as head of research at Signal Sciences and is a supporter of the rugged software and rugged DevOps movements. Seeing the gap in software testing, James founded an open source project, Gauntit, to serve as a rugged testing framework. All right. Well, you know, hey, everybody. Um, I, I think one of the best places to start in this is when we think about technical debt, um, what do we really mean? What do we, how do we, how do we view that? Um, in this, uh, this nice definition by Martin Fowler, it says, uh, technical debt is a wonderful metaphor developed by Ward Cunningham, but it's to help us think about this problem. Uh, and in this metaphor, we're, uh, we're able to say, like, if we do things quick and dirty, and uh, we do it in that way to get everything set up, that leaves us with technical debt, which is similar to financial debt. Uh, but he goes on later in the article to, you know, describe something that's very hard for us, or very important about the topic, is that the tricky thing about technical debt, of course, is that unlike money, it's impossible to measure effectively. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, Patrick, does that kind of resonate with you? I mean, you know, when we think about yeah, technical I'm, debt. Yeah, you know, when, when I think about this, like every company has it, every company that I've been at has um, had different types of technical debt. And I think that that kind of makes it more interesting of a topic too, because you look at, you know, one organization's technical debt, it, it's generally wildly different than another but there's some there's some overarching themes that are, are similar but you know at the, at the end of the day it's it's so hard to quantify in, in general just because yeah you know the design decisions of a group of people uh, from one place to the next are just going to vary so widely even if they're using the same off-the-shelf components yeah it's one of those things that when you you don't you you can't measure it but it's something that you you feel right, and you walk into an organization. Maybe it's your you know first couple of weeks on the on the the job at an organization, uh, and you start noticing some things. You're like, oh yeah, we kind of do it this this way, or we have some systems that no one really knows how to touch or how to how to deal with over here. Um, do, you, do you have any like tips for whenever people are are you, are you kind of discovering like the fact that you have technical debt, or as you are are dealing with it? I, I think what's interesting when I kind of look at technical debt too is. Uh, you know, there's, there's, yeah, there's that it feels bad or this, this particular process doesn't, doesn't ring right to me, but then there's also the, you know, you, you start moving along a path and, um, you know, I was, I was just looking at this today, uh, when I was cleaning up some technical debt of my own, um, you know, the future version of this, of this product is not going to support something that we're doing. And it's like, I know that's four months out and I'm actually going through and kind of cleaning it up now, but it wasn't technical debt until the, the, the off the shelf vendor released something, uh, you know, a new version of their open source software. Right. So it's, it's one of those things that, you know, it can change so rapidly uh, just by one press announcement. Yeah. Right. So, so it, it, part of it is the stuff and decisions that we make to take shortcuts. Right. Um, other yeah. part is just drift, like configuration drift, system drift. Uh, those are those things leave you. And, and if untended, if you have a, a system that doesn't have, um, you know, regular care and feeding, like we are, we are left with uh, with that's another yeah, yeah. Form of technical debt. I I think it's so interesting when you see the kinds of resources that um, companies will put in their operations uh, or security departments in general, right? Um, you know, I've seen really small teams. Um, and they, they say, oh, well, we're moving really fast. We're doing all this other stuff. And then you look at the system drift they've accumulated over time. And it's like, yeah, I mean, you, your, your team is so small that you cannot uh, go back and, and manage that technical debt. You can only focus on, on moving, you know, one could say moving stuff forward, except, you know, you're completely uh, ignoring the fact that you're on, you know, say like an old version of Chef or, or something like that. 
Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a, uh, it's, it, it is a, uh, it is a process of, uh, of kind of care and feeding. I think, and, and I think the, the idea of debt where it ties it back to kind of how we deal with our financial aspects. Um, I think that's real common. You know, you ever log into like your, your E-Trade account, you're like, Oh, I can't believe I invested in that thing that long ago. I need to like take care of that. Right. Or uh, being able to just get your you know financial uh, aspects in order is sometimes uh, um, really can, can be a, a process. And then sometimes it leaves you in a situation where, um, you're having to make, uh, you know, as Martin Fowler goes on in that article to talk about it, he's like, you're making interest payments, and and you can see those in in a situation um, whenever you're dealing with financial, <laughs> but they're hidden. They're hidden amongst our organization, right? We we sort of assume like, yeah. oh, that, that system over there is just working, you know, it's working, right? You're like, well, it's working, but like the engineers are nervously sweating about that system, you know, like um, right. every, every time, like, every time it pages out, you know, somebody's really, really like happy that it's not doing it at three in the morning. <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, uh, you know, that's a great example or a great thought. I, I remember, um, uh, you know, it's been been a while ago whenever I was dealing with a, with a certain system in a job, but uh, anytime I was on the on-call rotation, I was just, uh, I was just praying that like, that the one system that like none of us knew how to fix, like would not alert during my, you know, my, my week. Cause I was like, I knew that I'd, you know, be have to like do a lot of like uh, fiddling with it and it would, you know, you know, regularly go whenever the, the database backups happened at like 2 a.m. and it would fail. And it's just like, oh, please, please, like, let this be a good week for that, right? Because I know that'll, that'll like be a time suck. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, there's like, there's this like concept of, uh, I always joke of like systems archaeology when like you hit one of those things and it's your unlucky turn on the rotation when it's like, okay, great, I'm going to have to go through, dig and figure out, you know, how this thing was even built in the first place. I'll have to do some, uh, you know, pull from some sociology background and just ask people how it was written back in the day and, and just uh, just a complete time suck. That's right. Yeah. Well, now I think I think we have some um, some uh, poll questions uh, coming up here. Now, can we how do we display the first uh, question for the audience here? Uh, yeah. Are we doing the DevOps maturity question? Yeah. Yeah. Let's 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 kind of do that one to see how people are feeling. Um, I don't have it pulled up in front of me, so yeah, there we there we go. Uh, so for folks that are on the line here, um, can you just sort of give us a feeling for it? Like, are you are you kind of new to DevOps, uh, or, and you're just uh, getting there? Have you been working on it, uh, and you feel like you're improving in this, or have you been doing this for several years now, and you feel like you really uh, kind of put in a lot of uh, DevOps uh, uh, practices in place? Um, uh, so. Uh, Patrick, whenever you're kind of looking across the uh, uh, multi organizations, I know we're we're both uh, we work at vendors. We deal with a lot of customers. When you deal with folks, like where are people defined in this uh, spectrum normally? I mean, it it, it varies so widely, right? Um, we have such a wide range of customers. I think my fa when I think of one of my favorite stories about this though is when we look at um, when we look at customers who have you know, they, they have this idea that, hey, you know, we have this beautiful, really well-functioning CI, CD system, right? And then, you know, we're going to talk about visibility a little bit later, but, uh, you know, when we start when we start thinking about, like, okay, great, so we they install our product, they get the visibility, and then they're like, oh, wait a second, like, why are developers SCPing stuff, uh, you know, to to our production environment, right? And, and so it's like, okay, well, we thought that we had this, uh, we thought that we had this process. We thought that we had really good DevOps practices. And, uh, you know, surprisingly, uh, the answer is, well, you do, but you have this tech debt over in this corner, which is your CI system. Mm -hmm. That's that's a great example. And, you know, I, I, the, the results are shown up here on the screen about, uh, you know, look, we got a nice uh, Pareto distribution here, 80% saying improving, and then uh, outliers here on the on the 20%, uh, either, you know, immature or mature. And I feel like that is something that I see in the industry, even when we go to like a, a DevOps Enterprise Summit or DevOps Days where you have like large companies that are really talking about how they've been growing and sort of their DevOps practices. Um, you know what is what is it? Uh, what do we see as uh, what what the industry kind of has proposed as like a very successful you know DevOps implementation and a growing DevOps maturity to what is um, uh, 
to, and we see that for certain value streams and value pipelines or that the people have composed, but it's not like evenly distributed across the entire organization. So I feel like most of us, even if we have certain parts of our of our business or or value streams that have that have totally like adopted kind of DevOps practices, uh, we haven't done it you know across everything, and that, I think that's that's pretty normal. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. So let's talk about something now. Uh, a lot of these slides are um, are written kind of from you know Signal Sciences. We I think maybe we should say pretty quickly uh, what we do. So Signal Sciences, we function um, at the runtime layer. We provide a web next generation web application firewall solution that uh, that helps protect people uh, from attacks that are actually happening uh, that are actually that they actually face. Um, so uh, and and trying to like deal with that, deal with this. And one of the problems that we and that, that's kind of where we are. You want to kind of give a thread stack uh, summary. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, in a very similar way, you know, a lot of times uh, folks are looking to secure their infrastructure and looking to focus on the host side, right? Um, you know, what happens, there's there's the, you know, you kind of handle the front door and then there's the, great, so what's going on on our, on our, host, our host processes, right? Like, you know, when I look at us, we're kind of host intrusion detection, focusing on, you know, what are people doing on the servers? My when I talk to other technical folks, I, I talk about threat stack in the sense of like who did what where and when. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, you know, for us, I, I kind of look at it as you know that example that I gave earlier, where you know we think that the process is one way, but we don't have any way to actually verify that process. We don't have any way to actually see that people are doing what we expect them to do on servers. Um, I, I think that's where we really shine. Yeah. It, and I, I kind of find, and you know, you might have to, uh, you know, this is a little bit of a stretch here for people to to kind of think through this, but uh, and maybe this is something we should really kind of dive into is, um, and, and we, you know, I, I'm I'm kind of thinking about this from the application, and and you're kind of more on the host and config back inside, but when we look at this, uh, you can you can talk about like all the secure coding practices that you want to write, right? So you you release an application, uh, and you have you tested for all the all the things and you've written it so like there is no cross-site scripting yet um, time time goes by new uh, vulnerabilities and things like that come on the on, into play and now your system uh, may have may have a situation uh, at hand or, or not you don't know but uh, having something in the runtime state where we're able to look at like we're able to say uh, to validate like are you actually under attack where are you getting attacked right. these are some these are some problems that that you can't uh, look at and I think likewise on the configuration side you you're able to answer those questions uh, as well right yeah yeah for sure and you know um, another thing that comes to mind of, of stuff that I've seen in my time here is you know so you know you had your web application it's been you know it's been compromised in some way what did the person do once they forked a bash shell right like what did what did they kind of dig around and see um, this is something that I uh, recently kind of took a look into into uh, some folks uh, had, had come to us and said, hey, you know, we, we installed their agent, it's great, it's not reporting anymore. We start looking through the events and it's like, well, you know, yeah, your web server forked bash and, and uh, they started to dig around and poke around and find out what, what does ThreatSec do, right? Um, so it's interesting, you know, we we wouldn't have been able, you know, or they wouldn't have been able to figure out if their server was compromised in the first place um, without having us there, although, you know, at this point it was a little too late because that machine would already been compromised. But, you know, just having that visibility, and, and it always sucks uh, on my end to have to give that bad news, but, uh, you know, it's it's better that, that we were able to give that message and, and show them. And, and even if they did have the most, you know, secure coding practices in the world, uh, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't necessarily matter, right? Because, you know, at the end of the day, something was still compromised, and, and somebody was still poking around and using that server for their own means. Mm, yeah, well, and, and this this really gets to one of the visibility problems for technical debt, right? And um, for really how you kind of manage your systems in in a, in a way, right? You can't um, respond to something that you can't see. Uh, I think when you kind of give that example about like you don't have the telemetry back to be like, oh yeah, they they just you know destroyed that process. Um, I know both of our products like have have kind of that alerting built in, right? If agents start going offline, like, oh, that's like that's right. not good, right? You you want to know that. Right. Um, I also think there is a now with the way that uh, 
that uh, kind of we've, we've hybridized uh, uh, development, operations, and security. Um, we're you know we we see it where developers don't always have access to all the different pieces, yet they need they still need visibility into those, right? Um, yeah. You know, and I find that's that's one of the things where if we're we have systems that we kind of keep hidden or or we uh, you know we kind of leave untouched. Uh, there's it, it sort of turns into this black box type thinking, right? Yeah, and and, and also in organizations, you know, I've I've seen these kind of tools used for security organizations uh, that are um, unfortunately kind of stuck in the the old paradigm where you know we need to give them some visibility into what their AWS account is doing, but we don't necessarily want to give them access to the AWS account, right? So it's it's kind of flipping that on its on its side a little bit and saying. Um, you know, we don't we don't have a security department that we can give production access to, um, but we still need they still need to have information and telemetry on what's going on so that they can do their threat hunting and, and their job as well. Mm -hmm. Not yeah, it's not necessarily the world that I want, but it is it is something that I've definitely seen. Yeah, I think that's that's yeah, one right. key aspect about both of our products is we we sort of add that. Uh, uh, we had the visibility to uh, uh, groups that uh, weren't allowed to have it before. So, like, like what one thing we do is we take the you know previously web application firewall data, which was just sort of buried inside of like the security groups, and now that is now distributed out to uh, developers and operations, and in and in meaningful ways that like they're able to actually interact. With it. Well, and 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 also at the end of the day, you know, I think most people want to do the right thing, right? Like if somebody has information that hey this thing is getting hit this this api is getting hit with it just a really weird request and we are not handling it well like most of the developers i know would want to fix that uh part because they're incentivized be, by being on call but you know part because like it's the right thing to do and especially if it's an easy fix why not do it but when you don't have that visibility you don't know and you can't uh inspire the good nature of developers uh, of the world to actually fix the stuff you know that's right. Okay, let me let me drop a quick uh, uh, stat on you here. Okay, the the recent DevSecOps survey report came out in 2018, uh, in like uh, two three months ago. Um, but one of the stats in it that I thought was was incredible is that 48% of developers say that security is important and that they care about it, but they don't have enough time to spend on it, which you know, which I think we often like, um, you know, malign developers and say, oh, well, they don't, they don't really care. They don't want to do the right thing. Uh, that's that's sort of the narrative that security often provides. But I think, you know, developers are saying like more than half or, or about half are saying, hey, we, you know, we really believe that it's important, but like we don't, we just, uh, we just don't have enough time or cycles to spend on it. And the same survey. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. And, and the same survey also says, 91% of all respondents, like developers, operations, security, managers, everybody who responded to the survey, over 2,000 people, they said 91% said that security is, should be and is a part of everyone's role. Um, which to me, I, I think the security message has kind of, has, has, uh, has spread. I think we just haven't you know, given everybody the right tooling and the ability to like, you know, interact with it. Yeah, and I think what's interesting is uh, when we start thinking about it, it's, I love the security is everybody's responsibility thing. And at the same time, um, what I find in some organizations is when, when somebody says security is everybody's responsibility, it means that like, oh, well, you know, I, yeah, I have a secure password on this thing. I, I set up my, uh, you know, I'm always updating my dependencies, but other tasks or other workflows you know, don't necessarily get implemented, right, until there's an actual group of people that are responsible for it. Um, and then that kind of feeds into, you know, maturing the uh, the security cycle at an organization. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's right, that's right. Well, and it's a, um, just the, the divergence of those two things. I think everyone, everyone knows now in the modern world, like we, we do have to care about security, but only within the wheelhouse of stuff that like I actually know that I can affect or impact, right? So right. you know, GFA yeah. or whatever it is. But um, but the the desire for uh, developers to actually fix it and to do something that that matters. Now, uh, do do we have another poll question here? I, I I remember we had a couple throughout this and uh, and losing track of where we're supposed to add, ask the next one. Sure, uh, I can. I, 
cue that up. Uh, which poll question uh, did we have next? Uh, uh, let's, can we ask the uh, the critical to your organization one, the uh, tools that people are using? Absolutely. We can. There we go. All right. So. For this question, we want to know like which application security tools that you're using that you see as critical um, that you uh, you know may maybe are able to use to unlock uh, unlock the the visibility problem um, and just just see where people are are sitting with that. Okay, uh, Patrick, let's go back to like the security problem now, uh, and yeah. we'll we'll go back to the slide here in a second, but. Do you find that folks are really um, taking more of a legacy uh, application security approach or just a legacy approach to security in general um, that's maybe not realistic with like how people are actually being attacked? Yeah, I think that there's a, <laughs> yes, I think that there's a- I was hoping you would say that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think that there's this like divide between, um, you know, depending on how much legacy stuff that you have too, right? Uh, so I think that if you're, you're a company that you know, might not have had deployed everything using some automated fashion or you, know, you, you don't have necessarily good configuration management on, um, on, the, uh, you know, on your platform, then you know, great. So how do we actually start to begin to even like Think about security in a modern way because we haven't even done this basic hygiene in the first place. You know. Mm, yeah. You know what? You know what's great about the, the results here? This these results pretty much mimic the same findings in the DevSecOps uh, survey. So we're seeing that yeah. uh, most people uh, are saying like web app firewalls and container and application security are very important. Uh, with some static stuff, uh, composition analysis, um, and some uh, cloud environment analysis is like lower lower uh, adoption uh, type things. Uh, it's funny to yeah. me, some of these, like, the, the two high ones are two things that are uh, very divergent in how old they are, right? So web application firewalls, right. it's a very legacy type uh, thing. And then the uh, container and application security container is very, very new, of course, uh, but, like, adoption into that. So um, you have the old and the new kind of uh, conjoined here. Yeah, and, you know, interestingly enough to me is, I, you know, I always look at some of the when I was doing a lot of more research, everybody focused on stack application analysis. That was like the thing that, uh, you know, one of the groups that I was, uh, did you know, security research in really focused on. And at the same time, it always seemed like there were other, you know, there, there, that it wasn't, not that it wasn't important, it certainly was, um, but that there were other things that needed to be met, you know, from a, from a holistic view first. Yeah. That's that's totally true, and uh, we I think as a, as an industry we sort of adopted this idea that um, if we could just get everyone to write good enough code, like really really secure <laughs> code, like we would be okay, right? So, yeah. So yeah. I, yeah, yeah, you you can rewind the clock, you know, twelve years or so, and and everything that everybody was talking about, it you you hit it right on the head. It's static application analysis. Uh, we also hit on uh, developer training and awareness programs, right? And and those those are the things that we're supposed to to solve it. And uh, and everybody, and I don't know if you remember in um, what was it, 2007 or so, everyone kind of like went to to market with the whole like WAF suck type type uh, thing. There was a hashtag. It was it was a thing, right? Um, but that that was the, that was the idea that we would just go ahead and like just fix all the code because that's really it could be this thing could be trained out. But this ignores a real crucial aspect to uh, uh, to what actually code is, right? Code is written by humans. Uh, uh, no matter what you do, there's going to be a certain uh, error rate uh, that's going to happen for any any code that's that's ever written. Uh, of those yeah. of that, a certain percentage is going to be security related, and right. of that, a certain percentage is going to be exploitable. So maybe you could right. make it a little better through some training, but you're not going to fix through training, right? And that's the that's the real issue, right? right. Yeah, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, we're all humans and, and just, just trying to do the best we can here. That's that's right, yeah. But and and this is a, a slide kind of from the application side here that, that we see uh, happening at Signal Sciences. So we see folks like take their uh, legacy uh, approach to web application security, uh, and they they'll kind of do the OWASP top ten. But one of the things we we find is that um, there is a there's a lot more going on 
um, than just the OS top 10 these days. There's the, there's real world problems where you're, you're going to account takeover, uh, or you're having people you know doing forceful browsing or command injection, uh, use a lot of evasion, subdomain takeovers. There, there's a lot, there's a lot of other things that depending on your application, uh, depending on your organizational uh, organizational risk posture and and the way you sort of put it all together that, that you really care about uh, um, and that can really affect your business. Um, and so we, we've really shifted, you know, of course we, we you know, we provide uh, uh, protection for the OWASP top 10 and, and kind of normal uh, type application security things, but then we're able to also uh, instrument application flows through the system and we're able to, to discover whenever like you're under an account takeover attack, which has, you know, very significant business impact. Um, but is uh, is hard to detect kind of in the old way if you're just kind of taking a lot of legacy approach there. Um, yeah, and I think yeah. when I look at this from kind of the threat stack perspective, I, I think about, you know, how are people deploying their code into production? How are people like actually configuring, you know, their infrastructure? How are people setting up their, you know, AWS infrastructure? Are they doing that automated? Are they doing that? Because, you know, for us, you know, I think any tool, um, I think a lot of tools can have the potential to be really noisy, but when you start having automated workflows, you know, our tool becomes very, very good at being able to figure out, okay, this is something that usually happens. This is, you know, and, and you've written rules around it. You've written, you know, stuff to help you figure that out. Um, on the flip side, uh, you know, for folks that haven't done that, then yeah, there's, there's a lot of, you know, somebody's logging into a server, somebody's running manual commands, somebody's doing privilege escalation, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, that's the type of, uh, those are type of patterns that are unpredictable and, and not, not all of them, but a certain amount of uh, security problems are unpredictable at the time of whenever you release code. And let's say, let's say you never go back to like rework on that application ever again in the lifetime of it. Um, some of the, the stuff here on, on the right hand side, like, those are unpredictable um, kind of business style attacks that can happen that, um, uh, and maybe they're future looking that you weren't able to, to instrument or defend or attack or write about in that. So you have to have other types of uh, ways to do that with systems that are able to, um, to, to analyze that, right? Yeah, for sure. Okay, cool. Well, uh, let's, let's see now what were, I think we have one more uh, poll question, right? Um, uh, Let's let's talk. Yeah. Uh, I think we have a breaches one. Let's let's see if we can pull that. Yeah, one. yeah. Okay, pulling that. Up. Okay, while they're while we're pulling this up, um, we found some uh, we found some interesting data in the, the recent DevSecOps report, and uh, and I know that uh, for for ThreatStack and for Signal Sciences, you know, uh, some of our customers come to us uh, uh, out of like out of coming through the breach uh, breaches or seeing uh, others in their peer. Uh, peer companies, peer groups uh, also undergoing breaches. So uh, let's ask this, has have recent high profile breaches heightened your interest in DevSecOps practices for your organization? Um, so this is just a yes or no. Um, uh, don't let my, what I just said kind of sway you, but uh, we'd love to hear kind of how that's how that's going. Uh, uh, Patrick, how do you how do you feel that in, in your shop? Do you guys see uh, you know, a lot of folks coming in through through breaches? Yeah, I think what happens is, you know, once a breach kind of hits close to home, um, it starts to kind of, you know, inform how organizations start to think about risk, right? So, you know, when a breach to a you know, near peer type company happens, it starts to make it very easy to start to justify up, you know, why we want to start thinking about security, right? Um, and then, you know, <laughs> It was somebody at that organization gets tasked with, hey, you know, figure out how to secure, you know, vague hand gesture, the infrastructure, right? Uh, and and then, you know, then they start talking to us and it's like, okay, well, we want to be, we have this, we have this need, we need to be secure. We don't necessarily know what that means, but, you know, we know that this is part of it. Um, and then we start kind of start the cycle of trying to be like, okay, well, from a global view, how do you start? You're reducing risk in your infrastructure and see, you know, get that visibility that you need. Yeah, well, and th this is uh, this is good. We're getting the results back here too, and this maps pretty closely uh, to what we saw in the DevSecOps report. But 
Um, here we see that about two thirds are saying, yeah, you know, breaches uh, really heighten our interest in like how we do this, how we, we go across our organization with uh, about a third saying no. Um, for the DevSecOps community survey report, it, it was 74%, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, 73%, read that wrong, uh, report that, you know, breaches drove interest in DevSecOps. But another follow-up question on top of this, which I found, you know, extremely interesting being in kind of the application security uh, part of the house, um, one in three say that breaches, uh, they say that they experienced breaches or uh, thought they experienced breaches in the last 12 months due to web application vulnerabilities. Um, and so we see we see things like this front door. I know uh, you guys also see uh, a lot of folks kind of coming in through the, the cloud side or through the configuration end uh, on that. Um, yep. T talk to me about like how important is it to scale kind of your defenses to handle stuff that um, you know, maybe applications that you're not able to keep up to date, stuff that you've inherited from like, like third parties. Um, right, you know, right. Talk about like what, you know, what, what's really the scalability situation here? Like how do, you, how do we scale our defenses for, um, you know, stuff we're actively working on and stuff we worked on six months ago, things that we, we just can't keep everything patched and updated. So what, you know, what, how, do we, how do we live in this world uh, that we... Yeah, I mean, you're, I, I, I see it as, as, as a, a visibility problem, right? So like, you know, if I'm, I would love to be able to patch everything all the time. Uh, I would love for my developers to be always spending their time updating dependencies and, and going through and making that happen. Um, but I, I know that we're humans and also that time is a finite, uh, I have, we have a finite amount of time, right? So, you know, what it really comes down to is you, know, you look at some of the, the, the old way of, of looking at uh, security is, you know, putting firewalls around stuff, you know, just like, strictly only doing firewalls around stuff. Or, you know, you, the slide mentions, you're know, relying on inline architecture that's slow and inefficient, you know, pro, you know. There's so many different ways that, you know, folks have, have tried to segment stuff that, that doesn't work, right? Because, you know, I think of, you know, the old way of, of making sure that the, the outer wall is, is really strong, but everything inside can talk to each other and everything can move around laterally, right? Like how do you how do you protect against that? And you know, I, I like that you know on the threat stack side, our solution um, really allows folks to kind of connect those dots and see you know that kind of thing happening within their infrastructure. Right. It's it's moving moving and it's being able to go wide right across our infrastructure, yeah. um, both at the both at the, at the host layer. Uh, we see this from the uh, the application layer. So. Uh, often folks will have, you know, like our, their main, you know, applications and then sometimes it's like, oh, and we got this like uh, our, you know, marketing team's got this WordPress blog sitting over here, right? And it's like, oh, well, we can sit in front of that too. Um, oh, and we have some container-based uh, application uh, things over here and our, our API microservices are, are run over here. And, um, and uh, oh, and we have this really old part of our thing that we need to like set up into a uh, that it's like a network, uh, you know, like only the network team, like, you know, runs little proxies to it, you know, to let traffic in and out. We're like, hey, so one one thing that we've done, um, and I know you all are similar on the on the other side, but like we've, we've facilitated so you can be in any cloud, you can be in any application language, you can be in any web server, you can be in containers or or in any of those or even in like that network proxy mode, like we can install across all that. So you get a broad coverage and you're able to scale across all these things without kind of the old way of security where you, you put all these items, you know, in line, um, where you, you know, end up um, trying to, to wire all this stuff in and you, you never get full coverage of, of anything. And this is a... Yeah. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Oh, I, I was agreeing with you. I mean, uh, you know, I look at the way that, you know, for, you know, just we're able to see so much just because of where we sit in the infrastructure. And I really like that about... Uh, Y'all's product as well. Um, you know, it just it just works with any kind of, uh, it, regardless of the application type that you have on the back end. Yeah, right. And and I think that's you know I see like that that's one of the big similarities I see between uh, between our companies and what I kind of think of the new sort of the um, like the DevSecOps tool chain. It's it's um, being able to kind of get involved in any part of the stack in a very um, heterogeneous uh, collection of infrastructure and applications um, and being able to in, be able to secure that uh, in a way that's that's meaningful um, you know I, I, I love there's a there's a new book I don't know if you've, you've seen the uh, agile application security book it came out I guess late uh, last year but there's a quote in it and and I think this is like really uh, apt to understand like where security is and how it has to change 
Um, they say many security teams work with a worldview where their goal is to inhibit change as much as possible. And I think that one, one thing we're saying is like, if you're if you're living that kind of style and you're, you're going to compile, you're going to have a lot of technical debt, and you're not going to be able to survive kind of the new uh, modern kind of DevOps approach to uh, to, to working. Um, well, doesn't that kind of blow your mind? That's 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 still that's uh, the way many security people find themselves uh, today. Um, yet that's not where uh, kind of the rest of our industry is headed. Yeah, it, it blows my mind too because I, what I have found, you know. Being on the security side of things is, you know, when I work with folks and when I figure out a way to get to yes, um, or figure out what the question that they're trying to ask is, or find out what the goal is supposed to be, um, we work really well together. So it, it it kind of blows my mind when I go into some of those organizations, and it's like, yeah, no, like we're our job is to just say no to everything because that way we're safe. It's like, ah, oh, man, I don't think that's how it works, but. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> that's a, yep. That's a. Um, hope you don't plan on sticking around in the industry for more than a couple more years because it's going to be rough, uh, right. rough sledding for a little while. So, cool. Uh, well, um, I think we. Do, do you have any uh, other uh, slides or what? What else do we need to, to talk about here? I know we've kind of been kind of going through this this idea of, of adding visibility, stuff you can see, putting things you you know, adding the right security that matters, and be able to scale across your your platform. So to handle the, the technical debt piece, but um, yeah. Uh, what, what else uh, are, do we need to say here? You know, I think I think we I think we got a lot of it in here. Um, kind of coming up short. Uh, if we if we don't have any questions, uh, I don't know if we do or not. Let's see. Yeah, if, uh, if anybody has any questions for us, we'd love to like uh, kind of answer those for you. We could uh, speak from from either uh, kind of threat stack or signal sciences uh, point. Well, let, let me. Uh, uh, Ask like one question here. Uh, what do we, what do you see as kind of if you're if you're a security person and you're starting out kind of, uh, you know you're brought into a, a DevOps team. Um, what do you need to do in the thir first first uh, ninety days? What, what would you what would you recommend to folks? I mean, of course, buy our products. Let's let's get that. <laughs> of course, buy our products. Wait, wait. So what, what what would you do if you're a security person? Ah, man, you know. On my side, you know, when I was a new security person, I started to look around and figure out just what what gaps did we have in, you know, how I've seen systems run before, right? So, you know, even internally, it, you know, we had central user management, but it wasn't the way it wasn't uh, wasn't something like LDAP. It was Chef and putting users on every machine. So, basically, going in, cleaning up stuff, cleaning up. Uh, you know, how we do logging, making sure that we have a central place for folks to do logging. I mean, you know, this is just kind of what I did, uh, you know, in my first 90 days here. Um, but it, yeah, I think it varies so much depending on, you know, like we talked about earlier, what technical debt does your company have in the first place, right? What what things are you walking into and, and starting to say, hey, you know, we should, I've seen this. I've seen this done like this other places and it worked really well. You know, does that mesh here? Does that work here? Does that, uh, do we have a need for that here? And, and kind of going down that list. Mm -hmm. That's good. You know, and I think we should also realize that security, while, um, while they often have, are inheriting a lot of technical debt, um, um, even in like fast moving environments, um, you also re realize security has social debt, right? They're, they, they need to go in and sort of, um, Figure out a way how to enable uh, things to go faster and be safer at the same time. And so, um, yeah. I had a, I, I have a friend who's who's recently kind of dealing with this and kind of um, kind of coming into the the DevOps uh, um, spot at kind of a, a larger enterprise. And uh, one of my pieces of advice to him was, Hey, uh, you know, as you're going forward, like you got to not you have to you have to remove the word no from your vocabulary as a security person. It always needs to yeah. be like yes we can do it and here's how we're going to do it here's let's make it let's make it safer together let's let's automate this this uh, function um but you you have to like at least for a while here security has to get off of being being a blocker and being an enabler um, and that's something we see I, i've seen consistently across any high performing security team and sort of a devsecops uh, implementation uh is is moving that direction yeah, it's, it's almost like, you know, regardless of what the actual things that you end up doing, it's that you're actually working with other folks and, you know, creating a collaborative environment in the first place. 
Yeah. Um, and regardless of, of the things that I, I mentioned, you know, those were all in concert with other folks in the company. It wasn't just because, you know, oh, well, this is a security thing. It was, hey, you know, we figured out that we have a need for thing and, and you know, how, how do we get to yes on this, you know? Yeah, that's right. Take, take your uh, CISSP book off the shelf and throw it away and uh, <laughs> reference that or, you know, you know and, and, and try to really listen to what people are saying and then figure out how to, how to make it happen. Yeah. Well, hey, you know, I, I know we don't have any other questions coming in, so this has been a really, really good show and really appreciate uh, having, having uh, this conversation today. Yeah, likewise. All right, great. Well, thank you very much, Patrick and James, for a wonderful presentation today. Uh, I'd also like to thank today's sponsor, ThreatStack, for providing the vZone audience with a great webinar. And lastly, thank you to everyone who joined us today. We hope you learned something new that will help you in your developer career. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time.